Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. Praise God. Let's look at verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The word casting means to throw upon. It's not indicating like you would cast a fishing line and you're still holding on to it. But instead, it would mean to fling something completely away from you and onto the beast of burden. The example that is a great example is in Luke where Jesus is about to make the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and they bring him the colt that had never been ridden and they, they cast their garments upon the colt. They completely removed it from their possession and they threw it onto the beast of the, the, the donkey, the colt. They, they, they cast it away from them and onto the animal. That's the same word used here in 1 Peter 5, casting all of your care upon him. He wants you to cast all. Amen. Does your Bible say all? Is that just in my Bible? Does your Bible say that too? I thought so. Your Bible says all? So there's not one he intends for you to hold on to. There was a sister who called Charles Capps Ministry and she said, she, she was talking with, uh, with them. She said, if, I just want uh, to have y'all pray that, uh, she, I think she was actually talking with Brother Capps. She said, I just want to pray that you, if Jesus would just take half of my burdens, I think I could handle the other half. He would just take half of my burdens. He said, I can't pray that. That's not scriptural. You've got to cast all. You've got to cast all. This is not optional. This is not something that we can say, well, I'm going to hold on to this one. He said, casting all. This is actually how we humble ourselves. Because when we hold on to care, it's pride. According to this verse, it says, humble yourself, casting all. Humble yourself. In other words, I can't fix it, but I know God can. I'm not the fixer of this situation. I'm not the one who can make my life whole. He is. So I'm going to cast all my care in obedience to His Word upon Him. But I want to look at this second part as well. It says, for He cares for you. He cares for you. This word care, referring to Jesus, the Lord caring for you, God caring for you, it means to give meticulous attention, to be concerned, thoughtful, interested, aware of, or to give meticulous attention. He gives meticulous, you know, he has numbered the hairs, not counted, numbered the hairs on our head. When you brushed your hair this morning, he knows what number came out in the brush. He numbers. That's meticulous attention to detail about our life. He is engraving us upon the palms of his hands. He's very intimately acquainted with our lives. Amen. He's very interested in our lives. And he doesn't want us to carry our care. He says, cast all of your care upon the Lord, for he's giving meticulous attention to your life. This is trusting in the Lord. Amen. Trusting in the fact that He is my shepherd. He is able to keep me. I want to read a segment from uh, one of Brother Hagen's books. It's a story that I love to hear him tell. Uh, he says, When howling air raid sirens signaled another bombing raid in London. During World War II, everyone ran to the nearest air raid shelter. 
everyone that is except a certain elderly woman. The people in her neighborhood were busy during the daytime cleaning up the debris and trying to repair the damage inflicted by the bombs. At night, they huddled for protection in the air raid shelters. After several nights, someone commented that this elderly woman was missing. Some speculated that she had been injured and was in the hospital. Other neighbors wondered if she had been killed. Still others thought she'd gone away to the country to escape the bombs. A few days later, one of her neighbors met her on the street during the daytime and said, We are certainly glad to see that you're back and to know you're all right. And she said, I haven't been anywhere. Well, but you haven't joined us in the air raid shelter, the neighbor responded. Where have you been? She said, I was at home sleeping. Sleeping, he asked, astonished. How could you sleep through all this? Aren't you frightened? No, she replied, when I was reading my Bible the other day, I found where it says that God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So I decided there was no need for both of us to be awake. <laughs> so while the bombs are dropping around her, she is in her bed, refuses to go to the air raid shelter. All of her neighbors are in there huddled up, fearing for their lives, losing sleep. And she is just taking God at his word, Amen. trusting in the Lord. Look with me at Psalm 112 and verse 7. Hallelujah. Psalm 112 is a uh, chapter that speaks about the righteous, you and I. And here in verse 7, it says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Remember, let not your heart be troubled. There's not an evil tiding that can make you, force you to go in a different direction than this scripture encourages you and instructs you to go. You shall not be, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. Is that like having your mind stayed? His heart is fixed. Why? Trusting. So I keep my mind stayed because I'm trusting and I keep my heart fixed because I'm trusting. So trust has this supernatural ability to keep me focused on what's right. To keep me from, out of curiosity, following the link and reading through the posts and, and seeing what they're saying. No, I don't need to see what they're saying. I don't need to tune into that. I don't need to feed on that. Why? Because I'm keeping my mind stayed and my heart fixed because I trust in the Lord. It says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. Well, we looked at an established scripture this morning from Isaiah 54 where it says, In righteousness you shall be established. You will be far from oppression because you will not fear. So my establishing is an, is an establishing that guards me from fear. I don't have to enter into fear because I'm established in who I am in Christ. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm trusting in the Lord. Shall not be afraid. My heart is fixed. My heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. Hallelujah. So this is the inoculation against fear, trusting in the Lord. If I'm trusting, I'm already going in the right direction and the momentum of the trust is keeping me from turning and changing directions and going into the flow of fear. Psalm chapter 18 is a great place to find out what trusting people talk like. This, these are the kinds of things we say when we're trusting. Psalm 18, look with me at 28. Verse 
This is a Psalm of David. And his, he was one who's, God said, he's a man after my own heart. Trusting in the Lord, right? He says in verse 28, for you will light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. In other words, if I'm in a situation and I don't know what to do and it's confusing and it's dark and I can't see my way out of it, I'm going to depend on God to show me what to do. I'm going to look to Him for the answers. He's going to direct me in this. He's going to light my candle. He's going to enlighten my darkness. For by Thee, Lord, by Thee I have run through a troop and by my God have I leaped over a wall. Brother Hagin often said, if you want to have robust faith, how many wants to have robust faith? He said, if you want to have robust faith, rehearse often what God's done for you. Talk about what He's done for you. Hallelujah. In, in the uh, message that he wrote uh, and, and shared concerning uh, an interaction he had with the Lord, he called it writing your own ticket. Uh, he said that the Lord dealt with him about that scripture from uh, Mark chapter 5 about the woman and that the Lord said uh, that that woman, uh, that she said it, she received it, she, uh, uh, she said it, she acted upon it, she received it, and then she told it. She went and told it. And then he gave another example of that same uh, pattern in where David... Uh, said what he was going to do to Goliath. He, he uh, acted on it. He received it. And then there was the telling of it. They, I mean, they were rehearsing what David had done. And the Lord included that in that telling of it. Why? Because there's a faith building that happens when you tell it. When you tell what the Lord has done for you. And it's not just you building other people's faith who are hearing you, but you are strengthening yourself when you boast in the Lord. When you re rehearse what he's already done for you, you're like, oh, yeah, he did. He made me run through a troop. Because I couldn't run through a troop by myself, but because he was with me, I ran through a troop. Yeah. I leaped over a wall. Can you imagine? I mean, this wasn't him just being figurative in his speech. He's saying, the anointing came on me, and I grabbed a bear. And I smote a lion and killed a lion with my bare hands because of God with me. God is on my side. And what he did for me with the bear and what he did for me with the lion, it's going to happen with that uncircumcised Philistine who's blaspheming my God. He's strengthening himself in the Lord as he's boasting in what God has done for him. Trusting in the Lord. Verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler. And that is talking about a shield, a, a safety, an armament to all those that trust in Him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock, a refuge, a strong place save our God? It is God who girds me with strength. It is God who makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like hind's feet. He sets me upon my high places. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. You have also given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand has held me up and your gentleness has made me great. You have enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. Hallelujah. He is trusting in the Lord and stirring himself up in that trust. Glory to God. Psalm chapter 125 and verse 1. This is how we maintain the flow of restoration in our lives is that we're trusting in the Lord. We'll keep our mind stayed on him as we trust and we'll keep our heart fixed on him so that fear doesn't enter in. Psalm 125, 1 says, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. It specifically identifies the characteristic of immovability to let you know that when you're trusting in God, you're anchored. 
When you're trusting in God, the situation's not going to move you. The circumstance is not going to change you. You're going to be rooted and grounded in Him, rooted and grounded and immovable. Amen. Hallelujah. Those who trust in the Lord will abide. They will remain. They will be constant. They will be immovable. Hallelujah. Which is the main thing Jesus identified in his teaching on faith in Mark chapter 11. He says, if you believe and you do not doubt. Well, doubt means to be moved. Doubt means to stagger, to change your position. It means to be double-minded. It means, he says the, in James, the person who doubts is like a wave of the sea. That person is easily moved. They're moved by the wind, moved by the change in the circumstance, moved by the, the, the different direction that's going on around them. That's not you. That's not me and you. That's not us. We are not doubters. We are trusters in God. We are rooted in His Word. We believe God. Say it, I believe God. I believe God. And that believing is part of our trusting in Him. It also says in Psalm 28 and verse 7, I'm just sharing with you some of my favorite trust scriptures. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him and I am helped. There's a connection between our help and our trusting in Him. My heart trusted in Him and I'm helped. Hallelujah. My heart trusted and that connected me. That, that trusting of the heart, that faith in my heart connected me to His help. Remember, He's able to keep you in perfect peace, a well-developed, fully mature peace as your mind is stayed as that because you trust in Him. When I'm trust, He's able to help me. When I'm trusting, the door is open for His help. The avenue is clear for His help. But if I, if I leave that trust, if I move over into distrust, if I move over into doubt, if I move over into gloom, despair, and agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery, if I move over into that, God's like, oh, hey, hey, I can't help that. What are you saying that for? Why are you singing that song? So what do I need to say? You know, they came to Ziklag and everything they owned was gone. Their homes were burning. Burned to the ground. Their family was all taken captive. All of their children, their wives, all of them. And the, the people were so overwhelmed by the grief and the loss that they said, we're just going to kill you. It wasn't David's fault. Why did they want to kill David? Because they were so full of sorrow and loss and pain that they just wanted to lash out with their pain and, and blame it on somebody. They, they were going to kill David. David's experiencing the same kind of, of thoughts. His family's gone. His belongings are burning. He, he, he could at any time enter into the same despair that they're in, that they're, that they're resonating. He could have entered in, but in the middle of all of that loss and anger and hatred, he encouraged himself in the Lord. I, I would think at first they were like, you're doing what? My family is gone because I wasn't here. I was out fighting with you. My home is burned. My wife has is, is been taken captive. My innocent children are in the control of these people. And you're, you're dancing before the Lord. 
You're lifting your hands. You're praising the Lord. But you know, by the end of the story, they were glad he did. When, when he got some clear direction, none of them could see clearly in that fog of despair and pain and sorrow. You, it's it's, it's a, a shroud. It, it's a, a, a blinding so that all that you can see is that pain. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He had to move out of the natural and over into the spiritual to get the help from God that he needed. What if, what if he would have just given in? What if, the, what if the Shunammite woman had just given in to the circumstance and surrendered to it? What if Jairus would have just surrendered to what was happening in the natural? What if David would have just given in and sorrowed with the rest of them and they all turned on each other and tried to kill each other? But because somebody reached over into the provision of God, the spiritual supply to encourage himself, he didn't get any... God wasn't talking until he opened the avenue for God to talk. Help didn't, didn't shoot down like an arrow, like a bolt of lightning and say, dun, 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 ask God to help you. He just had to reach inside here and say, wait a minute. The Lord is my strength. He's the one who's helped me every time. Anything I've ever gotten out of, God is the one who helped me out of it. Anything that has ever been good in my life, God's been the doer of it. I'm going to turn to him. I'm going to ask him what I should do. He didn't even go to God and say, God, help me get him back. He said, Lord, do I? What do you want me to do? Do I pursue them? And God said, not only do you pursue them, but I want you to overtake and recover all. I want full restoration in your life. Everything the enemy has stolen from you, I want you to get it back. If he had never inquired of the Lord and encouraged himself in the Lord and got out of the emotional and over into the answer, this, we got to rely on the realm of the answer. He had to go over into the spiritual flow of encouraging himself in the Lord. What do you think, what kind of things do you think he might have said? And I think we could find it just by listening to how he talked to himself in the book of Psalms. Oh my soul, why are you disquieted within me? Let's hope in God. Let's, let's trust in the Lord. Let's look to the Lord. Let's recognize he's the creator of the heaven and earth. He's the way maker. He's the promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. He's the one who'll make a way where there doesn't seem to be the way. He's the one who can make rivers flow in the desert. He's, and it began to, isn't that what Jehoshaphat did when he was surrounded? Completely surrounded on every hand? He comes out before the Lord and he says, Lord, let's talk about you. I, I'm not here to talk about the surrounded enemy yet. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about how amazing you are. Let's talk about how awe-inspiring you are. And the help came. The answer came. The clarity came. Hallelujah. He says, if you'll trust in me, I can help you. If you'll trust in me, I can help you. If you'll turn to me, I can help you. Hallelujah. 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 You know, something that I, I, I see that I did not know when I first began to walk with God is that it can look really hopeless in the natural, but that doesn't hinder God at all from totally turning it around. That doesn't, that, it, it's not, it doesn't look that way to Him. He, he doesn't look and say, this is an opportunity to give up. This is, this is where you should just throw in the towel. J. Iris, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble him any further. Do not fear, only believe. Trust in me. Keep your faith focused. And we'll close with Psalm 13.
But I have trusted, verse 5, I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice. When I'm trusting, it doesn't seem like there's a lot for me to do in the expressing. We know the, the different verbiage that we saw that David declared. But when you've made the declaration, begin to rejoice. Begin to rejoice. I've trusted in you, and now my heart is rejoicing. My heart is rejoicing. Hallelujah. The evidence of trust is the rejoicing of the heart. This week's offer is Pastor Michelle's book, The Peace That Comes From Being Made Whole. Discover God's definition of peace and how it brings nothing missing and nothing broken in your life. Order your copy today by calling us at 501-487-97. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch live streams or watch messages again to build your faith anytime you desire with trusted teaching from Pastors Philip and Michelle Still as well as guest ministers and special events on our YouTube channel. Subscribe today and be ready to hear what God has for you. Thank you for your partnership. We have many ways that you can connect with us through your generous giving or prayers. Not only will your seed into this ministry help spread the gospel, it will produce a harvest in your own life. You can sow online, by mail, or by phone. Thank you for your faithful partnership. This is Pastor Philip Steele, and I want to invite you out to Little Rock's new Word of Faith Church, Faith Builders Church, right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our address is 10500 Markham. We have services Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday nights at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., our hour of power. If you're hungry for the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, if you're hungry for the moving of the Holy Ghost, then we're the church for you. We value the Word of God and believe that the Word of God is the answer to all of your problems. We have a whole slate of services that are available for your family. We have nursery ministry, children's ministry, and youth ministry, all geared towards building your faith and framing your world by the Word of God. I'd really love to see you. Come and see us. And until then, God bless you.